Welcome to The Cutting Edge with Dr. Lee Pearson and Dr. Robert Stubbefield. I'm Steve Richens, and on today's show, we have new reasons for realism. In J.J. Gibson's Direct Perception Theory, the informal title is there is no, this is not, we are not in the matrix. Well, that's, we are not in the matrix. This is, there is a real world out there and you perceive it. All right. I'll hand it over. Okay. Let, let me go ahead and just make a couple of remarks here, but the main, our main focus today, today is on Dr. Stubblefield, who will henceforth be referred to as Bob, since that's the way we do things here. And uh, he's the main stimulus for this, shall, to use a psychological term, because he recently finished reading J.J. Gibson's uh, magnificent work, The Senses Considered as Perceptual Systems, which I believe to be the most, there's a, there's a copy. Uh, here's my copy. Uh, this was given to me by Mrs. Gibson. Unfortunately, it's not a copy that had J.J. Gibson's autograph. I said some other things, but um, I, I should disclose uh, off the top and I've done this before, but just, just to mention it again, that uh, as, a, as a matter of full disclosure, as they say, I was J.J. Gibson's last PhD student. I was not his last PhD, and I don't know who that was, but I wasn't his last PhD because he died while I was doing my PhD thesis, which is not a good thing, by the way, if you're, you graduate students out there, don't let your advisor die. Plus, I, I liked the man and enjoyed his company, and that was a you know, wrenching thing, but it also wasn't good for my PhD. Anyway, I was his last official graduate student, and I actually put him on my graduate committee while he was officially retired. He was already officially retired when I did so, because what happened was when I went to Cornell University, that was where he um, taught, I went there to study with Ulrich Neisser who was the purported father of cognitive psychology, the, you know, the, the man who created the field in, in, in some sense. He, he wrote the book, Cognitive Psychology. And, uh, well, anyway, that's, that's a whole other story. But along the way, I happened to go into the Gibson seminar just because I'm curious. I had been told by my main undergraduate advisor that Gibson was crazy. But anyway, I went to, I happened to go to this seminar and I was awestruck because here is a professor in the psychology department who was saying, there's a real world out there and we perceive the real, that real world. And I'd never heard that from a, a psychology professor. They're all about construction, putting things together, making uh, models that are in your head, representations, all that kind of stuff. That's what cognitive psychology is about. And I'd heard that for, you know, ages and I'd never heard this. And I was just, I was awestruck by it. So I continued to go to the seminar for years and years. And after he died, I ran the seminar for about, a, that seminar for about a year. But anyway, I, I, I'm really a something, even after all of my study, I'm something of an amateur in that field. Perception was never my main field. My main field was thinking and introspection, things like that. Uh, uh, so I learned something but I'm not the best expert I could be. Now, Robert Stubblefield, Bob has read The Senses Considered, which I think is the most important book, certainly for objectivists to read. But I, I mean, it's really his main theoretical work, even though there's a later book, has some advances beyond it, the, the Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. That's his later book. And he has an earlier book also. Here's the earlier book, The Perception of the Visual World. But his really, you know, the peak of theorizing is in the, book called The Census Considered as Perceptual Systems. And what he's doing there, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob momentarily uh, that we get his perspective on it. What he's doing is he's contrasting the census considered as perceptual systems as an active uh, uh, agency, really, uh, a go that goes around and uh, with you as the perceiver are an active agency agent that goes around and picks up and achieve uh, the achievement of getting information about the world as opposed to passively sitting there. And that's the sense is considered as channels of sensation. That's the contrast. That's the idea that you sit there and a stimulus comes into your sense organs. You sit there passively. They come into your brain in, in the form of neural signals. And then your brain 
uh, puts them together somehow and produces a something called the percept. So it's it's really as if you were a uh, brain, the old brain in a vat. You just your brain just sitting there. There are signals. Who knows what those signals where they really come from? It doesn't matter. And your brain somehow puts them together and produces a percept. That's the position that Gibson is arguing against and saying that uh, perception is an active process that involves the pickup of information which exists in the light, in the structure of the light, ambient light that surrounds that you can sample, that an observer can sample. There's a lot of structure in that light and it's often ignored. Uh, and I could say more, but I really should turn over to Bob here because I, what we're really interested in today is what is Bob's uh, perspective that he gained by reading it and then we'll talk about that. So Bob, uh, take it away, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, sort of a, a side issue, which one should be cognizant of, is the issue of semantics. You often hear about how these people really don't disagree, it's just an issue of semantics. <laughs> and sometimes that's true. And in some of the points here, that will be true. But of course, other times it's false. There really is a difference of view. So we, have, we wanna sort out which is which in this discussion. In particular, a couple of concepts that are, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, I don't know, uh, problematic would be sensation and integration. Uh, I should offer a disclaimer myself. I am not a scientific expert on perception. But, uh, I've, I've got a layman's view of perception as augmented by what I've read in Gibson's book. Uh, now, part of the motivation for being interested in this issue is that both Lee and Harry Binswanger have argued that the standard objectivist description of perception is wrong. And so that was my motivation for reading this, this book, is to find out are, are they correct or not. And uh, uh, I, I get to reveal my opinion is the answer is yes and no. And, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get to both sides of that as we go. Uh, the, the no part has to do with semantics. The yes part has to do with what's actually happening. Uh, so, uh, there's a general agreement in what the objectivist view of perception is and what Gibson's view of perception is. The general agreement is that uh, perception is of the object, it's of the real world, it's of what's out there. Uh, that's the output. Your output of your, of your, your whatever your body, soul, et cetera, it's, system is, is an object and emotions of the object, et cetera, things that are out there in the real world. And there's also agreement on what the input is. In a, if you get far enough away to look at the input, the input is the, uh, the ambient energy of the real world. And that's detected by the object that results by the thing that results with perception. So that's that's the yes part, uh, or actually that's the no part. Harry and, and Lee are wrong, but uh, objectivism does not argue against uh, uh, what's true. The yes part is that they're right, is that what do you mean by, take the literal words that are in, uh, if you look up in the lexicon, quote, or perception is a group of sensations automatically retained and integrated by the brain of a living organism, which gives it the ability to be aware of, to be aware, not of single stimuli, but of entities, of things. An animal is guided not merely by immediate sensations, but by perception. So uh, if, you, if you take that literally, 
as the will, then uh, automatically retained and integrated group of sensations. That is the, the, the theory of perception that was existing before Gibson. It's the theory of perception that Gibson argues against. And uh, my conclusion, by the way, is that Gibson successfully argues against that. That, uh, that is not the way perception is done, but that's a scientific comment, not a philosophic comment. The philosophic comment remains the same. The output is objects that you're, you perceive objects in reality. That's the output. By the way, that's very explicit in objectivism. I searched for an explicit statement of that in Gibson, and I couldn't find it. It's implicit, it's all over the place, but I don't find an explicit statement. That the thing that perception does is give you objects. So uh, Lee, you may be able to find one more easily than I could. Uh, so Gibbs argued that what you perceive, when you perceive an object, we observe the objects, well, this is from Wikipedia, this, this comment. So I, I don't quite, uh, it doesn't quite say what I read when I got to, when I read Gibson's work, but I'll read it anyway. Gibson argued that when we perceive an object, we observe the object's affordances and not its particular qualities. He believed that perceiving affordances of an object is easier than perceiving the many different qualities an object may have. Now, affordances was not a word that was really used in this book. It, it comes in, a, it may have been used earlier, it may have been used later. Uh, it does names, it hints at what Gibson was doing, but I don't think it really names it precisely. Uh, the essential agreement that the living organism gets direct knowledge of the world from ambient energy, energy that it detects in reality. That's, that's the phrase that I would say is both Gibson and objectives. The differences, the, the main difference is that, and he has already hinted at this in his introduction. I see two, two main differences. One is that perception is an active process. It's not a static uh, snapshot of what's going on. It's, and here I'll use a word that we will jump on. It's an integration across time of various aspects of what's out there in reality. Uh, that's the, the, the first uh, difference. Uh, the other difference is that has to do with what integration of, of sensations might mean. And the simple view that Gibson is arguing against is that you have these, these various sensations which come from sense organs and your brain automatically integrates them into a perception. Gibson's view is that and in it, Bella, what's really going on is that there is a whole process. The result of that process is the perception. Now, loosely, you might say, well, that's an integration of all the things you detect from the ambient energy. And in that sense, integration occurs. But uh, uh, another phrase in the, in the objectivist wording about it, by the brain, leaves a lot of Gibson out. Gibson talks about the whole neural system. He talks about the body. He talks about the things that your body detects, which are not normally counted as the five senses, like whether or not, the, which way is up, for example. Uh, so I, I think I've made my case that Harry and Lee are both right and wrong. They're, they're right 
that the description taken literally in the objectivist literature specifies some, an incorrect scientific theory of perception. They're wrong in that if you step far enough away from that and ask what the essentials of that statement are, essentially, there's energy out in the world, you detect it, and you get a perception. You, you perceive an object. And that's as much as I really have prepared. Okay, that's very good. I, I enjoyed that and I think made some good points. Let me see here. Um, one thing that just occurred to me, just as you just mentioned energy again, is it's not, it's not so much that Gibson says that you detect the energy, but you pick up the information, that is to say the structure that's in the energy uh, by the process that he calls the extraction of, in, of invariance. And that's a different thing than just detecting the energy per se. He's, what he's do, what's actually detected are the things in the world. And you know, Gibson didn't quite put it this way, but he never uses the term integration in his book for what the perceptual systems do. And that's because you don't have to integrate what's all, what, what, you know, what God has not put asunder, you do not have to put together. The world is already put together. The task of perception is not to construct the world, integrate a world from elements or little bits and pieces, is to detect the world as it is. So there's no need for a process of integration, according to Gibson. It's a process of detection instead, where you, the, there's information in the light that specifies the world as it is, all put together. You don't have to associate things, but you know, put them together by association. They're already there. Um, so, so the yeah. the, the, idea, the idea that the, that the uh, brain does the integration, then you have to ask on what. And here I would ask uh, Bob didn't get into this. What's meant by the term sensation? In the history of psychology, and Gibson does, does discuss this in in the, the census. The term sensation is highly equivocal. It's used for various things, including conscious experiences and uh, the, the signals uh, from and the, the sensory nerves send uh, signals, so to speak, to, to the brain. And uh, people move back and forth between those meanings. And I think there's some others as well. What objectivism does, I think, is I don't think objectivism is equivocal, uh, as I remember on this point, uh, but Ayn Rand does not define sensation. At least I've never seen that. Uh, I don't remember seeing it. Leonard Peikoff in Opar does. And he says, uh, a sensation is, a, I'm, I'm quoting from memory now, it could be a slightly off, uh, an irreducible response resulting from the stimulation of a receptor. I don't know if he used the term receptor, but you know, a receptor cell. So it's, it's an irreducible conscious experience is what it is in objectivism. Now, there you have to answer the question, how in the world would irreducible conscious experiences, which are, non, which are not a physical phenomenon, which are a phenomenon of consciousness, how does the brain, which is a physical entity, uh, integrate those things? How does that happen? There is no answer given to that anywhere in the objectivist literature, nor is that answer given anywhere, anywhere else that I know of. And I don't think that happens. It's not the way it works. The, according to Gibson, the conscious uh, sensory qualities, things like, you know, patches of color, uh, you know, you see an orange, you see a kind of roundish, orangish in this theory, you see a kind of roundish, orangish patch, and, and maybe you integrate that with some other things, including your, when you, your impulses when, uh, when you touch it. And you end up with with a with a percept, and the term percept is another tricky term. Um, a percept is somehow an integration of sensation, so it's not the object out there. What the hell is it? You know what 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 is the percept doing? So Gibson just rejects all of that. He says the sensory qualities, according to Gibson, have nothing to do with perception. They're in a different chain. The, the uh, sensation is in a uh, unidirectional chain from the world, and it ultimately ends up with, with sensations and consciousness in one direction. Gibson, that sense is considered as channels of sensation. Gibson says 
that it's a more of a circular thing uh, with, you know, feedback would be a term for it is what is uh, when you get sensory impulses, there's uh, the system and Gibson uses the uh, somewhat mysterious term resonates to that. And it, it um, um, adapts, not adapts. That's the right word. Huh. Um, it acts actually, uh, it acts, <laughs> initiates action to get more information to, uh, to, to uh, uh, acquire more information. And information is acquired by what Gibson calls extracting invariance from the stimulation. In order to get invariance, you need variation. And we're gonna, uh, Steve, in a while, we'll put up uh, some examples of what Gibson means by an invariant. Well, there's one right now. Um, but, but in order to get invariance, you have to have variation either over time or space. And your own action, provides the variation or some of the variation from which invariance can be extracted. So perception is an active process, not passively sitting there waiting for, uh, you know, the world to get into your head, uh, which is um, the, the, that, that view of perception as integration of sensations is that kind of passive view. Now, I don't know exactly where the particular definition that objectivism uses for perception, where that actually came from. I asked Dr. Peacock once about that, and he said, well, Ayn Rand told it to me. Where did she get it? I don't know. It's kind of similar to what William James would say or Hermann von Helmholtz. But in, in my understanding, the closest thing to the de objectivist definition in the history of uh, psychology and philosophy is Kant. Kant uh, has a very similar definition. He says that, and I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing, and I'm not claiming to be a Kant scholar, so I, again, I could be a little off on this, but Kant claims that perception is uh, occurs from the integration of sensations by the mind. The big difference is Kant says it's by the mind, objectivism says it's by the brain. I don't think either of those things is correct. Sensation is irrelevant to perception in the, in the, sense, in the sense of sensation that Dr. Peacock used. In the sense of sensation as a uh, inputs to the, uh, well, uh, inputs and outputs, uh, inputs to and outputs from the sensory nerves. Uh, it's also not correct to say that that's the stimulus for perception because that's this uni this passive unidirectional process, whereas Gibson emphasizes that there's a, uh, what amounts to a feedback loop. And that's what makes the senses considered as perceptual systems different. Maybe we should, uh, Steve, uh, put that or uh, David, uh, uh, Daniel, sorry, Daniel might want to put that back up. So I just say something a little bit, uh, I want to say something a little bit more concretely about Gibson. We cannot give a, a, a comprehensive lesson and that, that's not our purpose in the cutting edge anyway, but I want to give you some idea and also suggest that uh, those interested in, in this topic absolutely should read uh, Gibson's uh, works uh, that he wrote himself, especially the senses considered as perceptual systems, which is unfortunately not so easy to get hold of. And you can find it in libraries. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's in print again, I'm not quite sure, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it seems to be a little hard to get hold of, but that's the most important work for objectivists to read, to see what Gibson is really criticizing as that kind of theory. Um, and it's, I, can't, I cannot replace the, what the census says, but just to give you an idea of, of the Gibsonian approach, uh, one of the things, he, uh, the thing that he's probably most famous for is uh, what's called the texture gradient. You look at this picture and there's a kind of a checkerboard uh, there. That's the surface of a, uh, somewhere and it has a texture. Now, this is a particularly regular texture, but it doesn't really have to be that regular. It could be just as uh, one person put it, um, it could just be stochastically regular. There could be elements. They don't have to be exactly the same size they don't have to be, it, has, it doesn't have to be perfectly homogeneous, but in a, a rough sense, there's some homogeneity. And this is a abstracted version of a, of a uh, surface of support for those cylinders. And the point here is that uh, when people talk about perceiving objects in the world, and Gibson did talk about perceiving objects, but he didn't um, delimit it. He's, he had a list of several things that you perceive, events, objects, surfaces, uh, I had a list, I, I, I could find that objects is part of that list, but he didn't limit perception to just objects. Um, 
there, there are other things that come under that uh, rubric. Anyway, here we have objects, perception of objects. And in the classical theories, um, they would talk about things like the visual angles subtended by the object. But you notice the visual angles of those two cylinders are different than the subtended by your eye. The further, the further away, you don't know that, but the, 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 the object higher up on the picture has, subtends a smaller angle. And you somehow have to correct for that. And there are all kinds of theories about how, how that correction works. And maybe you use triangle, similar triangles and trigonometry and you know, whatever. But what Gibson points out is that there is information in the light to your eye that directly specifies the size of the object. And that is the number of texture elements covered. The number of texture elements covered by a cylinder of that size will be the same number no matter where it is on the surface. If it's way, way out there, the, the texture elements will be small and the visual angle will be small, but it'll cover the same number of texture elements. If it's close up, it will also, it, you know, the texture elements will be bigger and the angle subtended by your eye will be bigger, but it covers the same number of texture elements. And if a perceptual system can pick up that information, that specifying information, can extract that invariant from the variation over space here, then you'll be able to see it, uh, uh, the size. You'll be able, to see, for, for example, in this case, just one more thing. You'll be able to see that the two cylinders are are the same in size, even though the visual yeah, angles. Are I mean, yeah, they are. I think they're. Well, maybe this, they're not. In this the case, let me, one, maybe six, they. Seven, maybe this is a. One, two, you're right. They're not. <laughs> Sorry, they're not. They, they, you're absolutely right, Bob. They're not. Be, uh, but we know that we perceive that because we can, if the visual system can pick up that the cylinder further away, which apparently is larger actually, even though the visual angle. So then this diagram actually is not showing them as equal. It's showing the further away one is larger. And why is that? Because it covers up, you know, one, two, four texture elements. And, the, and this one closer is covering up roughly two. So that uh, you would, uh, if, if the visual system, if your visual system is sensitive to that invariant, you can see that the, uh, Further away object is something in the area of twice as, as, as big, actually. Well, how do, what about the narrowness of it? They both cover about one. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a taller but roughly equal <laughs> narrowness, I think. Uh, it's a taller but roughly equal cylinder. So anyway, that, that, the point is, in any, in any case, that there's information in the structure of the light that specifies that and does not require some kind of process of construction or integration of, of sensory quali qualities. The, the sensory qualities are irrelevant. This is all done, by the way, this pickup process is not done by the conscious mind. It is done by the organism without uh, uh, being aware. You, in general, you're not aware when you look of, of the um, uh, informational basis in the structure of light. So you don't have an awareness that you then look at and produce a per percept from. That's why it's direct perception. But okay, back saying, to Bob. While you're saying that the sensory qualities are irrelevant, you're not saying that the senses are irrelevant. Absolutely not, of course. A a Gibson doesn't believe in extrasensory perception. Right. <laughs> the senses considered the as perceptual story. systems. Yeah, the yes. senses considered as perceptual systems. Not, not uh, that we use ESP, it's not, it's not magic. So yeah, of course. Uh, uh, well, they, they are in yeah. fact uh, input to the perceptual system. Not the senses qua the old the, thing, but the yeah. fact that things are detected by a particular physical apparatus, receptor yes. various types. Yeah. And all that is integrated somehow or Systematized, <laughs> if you will. So that well, it's not put. It's already together. It doesn't have to be put together. Well, let's go to the other example, uh, Steve. Uh, it's detected. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Go uh, ahead, Steve. Da Daniel gave uh, Peikoff's OPAR the definition that he found: a sensation is an irreducible state. If awareness uh, of aware, of I think awareness. to say of awareness. Yeah produced by the action of the stimulus of the sense organ. The problem with yep. that is that it's, there's environmental uh, actions. The ambient light is producing uh, information 
So that's why that's too delimited. Well, uh, actually, I think I'm perfectly happy with that definition. But it's just that under that definition, see, uh, what I'd say is that that's not uh, perception does is not constructed from integrating those things. You don't have conscious experiences uh, that you then integrate into a, fir- a, a, a second level of conscious experience that is perception. It doesn't work that way. Those things are, those experiences, which we do have uh, in a way, I mean, we don't, as uh, it's pointed out in that same uh, passage in, uh, in Opar, it is point out, pointed out correctly that we don't really experience, at least not as adults, um, isolated sensations. I'm not sure there's any reason to think that babies do either for that matter, but uh, certainly we don't experience them that, in that isolated, but you can, kind of by abstraction you can say well you know there's a there's a when i look at an orange i I can kind of focus it's a kind of introspection really to focus on the uh, on there being a circular oranges patch but your brain does not take that circular oranges patch and 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 integrate it with other stuff into perception that's not how it works perception doesn't use that sensory uh quality uh, uh material at all to produce the perception comes from the pickup of information which is in the structure of the light and it's not it's not that there's some uh, stuff in consciousness first that is then integrated into some further thing in consciousness which is a perception it doesn't work that way that's at least according to gibson i think gibson is right and let's and just go ahead yeah go ahead it's, Sorry, Steve. It, uh it's uh clarifying to to differentiate you know radiate uh, uh radiate uh, radiant light from ambient light because the the sun is a is uh we don't perceive all of that we perceive the interaction of the objects in the environment so the ambient light as far as we can tell from the n- naked eye is what the ambient light is right yeah is that- the ambient light is what is the light as, as it bounces off of all of these objects and obtain structure from its interaction with the objects and that structure enables our perception. We don't, per- we don't perceive light. Light is the medium of perception, not the object. We perceive by means of the structure in the light that comes off of it, you know, when it bounces off stuff and it's ambient in the sense that it's always there. It's always there. Uh, you know, when, when, if the sun's out, there's always a uh, light. And so we can extract those invariants. Uh, the perceptual systems can pick that stuff up over time. As, as uh, Bob pointed out later, perceiving is not a bunch of little snapshots. It's a process that occurs over time. Maybe you could put up that other, Daniel, that other uh, picture that we have. There's a nice tree and there's some telephone poles. <laughs> and this is again on a surface. Now this surface uh, doesn't indicate any texture. So we're not gonna use the texture inv- invariant, which we could probably in, in the re- reality. But there's another invariant, which is one of my favorites. Um, just to illustrate what an invariant means for Gibson. Look at all those telephone poles. Now, they go off to a a horizon line. You see the horizon line drawn there. And in order to to be able to do this, you have to be able to pick out where the horizon is. But we're normally pretty good at that. So if you can, now you'll notice that, again, these uh, telephone poles actually subtend very different angles to your eye. The one that, uh, I, I can't point here, but one of, on the far left, <laughs> the, uh, the far left, that subtends a very large angle. And then you go over there, it, goes, it just kind of disappears on the right-hand side. Can't see much of anything, but they get progressively smaller. And in, again, in, uh, in uh, your standard theories of perception, uh, there would have to be some process of, of correcting. See, the, the idea that would be that there's a, a certain amount that's, appears on your retina you know there's a certain distance and that distance gets smaller and smaller than what appears on your retina and the people that think of the retina what's on your retina as the stimulus for perception which is not gibson's view uh they have to figure out how do you how do you correct for that how do you make a correction because the the telephone poles are indeed perceived as being uh equal height even here i think you'll you'll look at them and if you see it as a three-dimensional layout, um, you'll see them as, as equal height. 
So how does how does that work? Well, some people would say there are corrections. Uh, I don't know. There are various ways you could talk about that. Some people say that because telephone poles are familiar to us, and we know that we have knowledge, conceptual knowledge, that they're the same size, and we use that to correct our perceptions. That's kind of a Kantian approach. Our concepts correct our perceptions. Gibson says there is a rich stimulus information in the light available to the eye. And you just need to be able to figure out what that uh, structure, you know, how to describe the structure. And here it's what Gibson called the horizon ratio. And the idea is, and this is really just a matter of projective geometry, really, uh, that an object of a given height, no matter where it is on that surface, if it's very close to you or it's very far away, it will have the same ratio of uh, the, the uh, array um, subtended to the eye, the, the array of, of light subtended to the eye will have the same ratio of the part of the telephone pole above the horizon level to below. That ratio is a constant. It's an invariant. So here it looks like I would say it's roughly a two to one ratio. Look at that, that first one where you can see it most easily. There's more above than below. So it's something like, but you'll see that that ratio is the same for all those telephone poles. And therefore you will see those telephone poles as equal in height. And furthermore, there is an absolute uh, anchor point for this activity. If some object happens to, if the top of the object happens to kiss the horizon, we don't have one there, but if it just, if there was one there that just touched, kissed the horizon, that object would be at eye level no matter where it is on the surface, no matter how far away or how close. So if this visual system is sensitive to that, there is stimulus information for the direct perception of height rather than some kind of something based on inference, which the usual theories uh, do because they try to build it up. They try to build up uh, perception from sensations or something like sensations. And, and those things are not meaningful enough. You need to, you need the, you know, those theories require supplementation when you uh, try to explain how perception works. Now, I wanted to extend, oh, go ahead, Bob, okay, well, no, you, a comment. You, you meant relative height, not absolute height. Say that again, I, I didn't catch okay. that. You, you meant, you, you said they're the same height, or, or rather you said you get direct information of height. And yeah. what, what you meant is you get direct information of relative height, those are all the same. Yes, but I did mention that there is a, an anchor point yeah. of um, the t when you when something so there's something like a zero, an, you know, a, 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 well, it's an anchoring point where you could actually relate it to it's it's always relational. I mean, in some sense, yeah, uh, that um, that allows you to relate it to your own to yourself to your eye level. It gives you that. So yes, yeah, certainly, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 talking about the height of an object. Of some object as being the only thing in the universe, you know, <laughs> and what's the height of this of something that's the only thing in the universe is, is essentially meaningless. So of course we're always talking about relative in some sense. You know, we'd have a standard of measurement, a foot, let's say, or a meter. We relate other heights to that. So there, it is relational. I, I agree with that. If that's your point. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've been trying to use my imagination about the uh, supposing instead of this nice flat plane that this is on it yeah. is a, a valley somewhere yeah um, that's a complication <laughs> yeah yeah and i i don't you know somebody would have to look at that carefully you'd have to be there'd be some uh there'd still be invariance and there'd be some way that you would detect that there's a valley and so that uh i mean that does change this it, it, it won't be as simple <laughs> And I would suggest that we shouldn't worry about that case until everybody understands the simple case as, you know, how that works. Um, well, it may I, be, I, would... I don't know if that's been studied. The, the, that, the, it may be that our perception is not as good uh, for height when you have that kind of, you know, rolling hills and stuff. I don't, I don't know. That, that may be. Well, so... there are, of course, there are other sources because, remember, there would also be a texture gradient. Right, and the texture gradient would give you information as well, and there are probably other sources of information. I'm not saying this is the only one, the only yeah. source. I, I was just imagining the first pole, or the, rather the second pole from the left, is in a valley, uh -huh. uh, so there would yeah. be a dip in the texture. 
Yeah, and, and that would have to be accounted for somehow. That, that second pole is actually longer than the first pole. Yeah. Yeah, it could be if there's a dip. But of course, you could perceive that dip and there'd be information for that. So yeah. the visual system presumably would take that into account. But I, I don't know how. And I don't want to speculate that it would involve, I don't want to say that it would involve some kind of serious inference uh, process because that's, that's not Gibson's way. But anyway, this is the simple, in this simple case, uh, it just illustrates, I think it's a good illustration of what Gibson means by an invariant. Although Gibson usually uh, mostly wants to talk about dynamic invariance, the invariance you get by moving. And this is a static invariant over, over spatial layout, you know, it's a little different, but I think you can convert this to a, a dynamic invariant for our purposes of illustration by imagining, speaking of imagination, that you walk, you walk towards one of these telephone poles. Imagine you walk towards, let's say that second telephone pole from the left, you start, you walk towards it. As you walk towards it, the visual angle subtended by the eye will increase. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's a that's variation. And if you're if you were, and that would also be true of your sensory qualia, you know, your your um, uh, the patch of color would also kind of be you'd see it as increasing. And so if you were using that for perception, if that patch of sensory quality were being used for perception, you'd have to compensate for it in some way. But what Gibson says is. We don't use the sensory qualia. The fact that the visual angle is increasing doesn't really matter. What matters is that the horizon invariant still exists and it still would be the same ratio. And so we see the, um, the thing as being the same height, the, the telephone pole as being the same height. So um, there's, a, there's obviously a lot more to be said. This is just scratching, barely scratching the surface, but that gives you some idea of how the Gibson view is different from views that involve taking in meaningless sensations and and somehow uh, constructing a, a meaningful percept and that how how you go from meaningless sensations to a meaningful percept how that works has never been uh, uh, convincingly explicated the greatest genius in the field of perception in the 19th century was Hermann von Helmholtz and he uh, in his, the third volume of the Physiological Optics, he makes a heroic effort to explain how what he calls unconscious inference. I, he rarely uses that term, but he's famous for that term. Uh, how unconscious, in, unconscious inference would produce perception, but it really didn't. It didn't work. It, it didn't quite succeed. He, he didn't quite succeed, and he was, you know, formidable uh, intellectually. He was, um, you know, one of the last of the the. Um, uh, comprehensive scientists that cover almost every field of science. Nobody can do that anymore. But he, he anyway, he tried it and it didn't work. I don't think any any theorist since because it doesn't work that way. It's not that we don't integrate sensations into perceptions. And the process to come back to put this back in the ball back into Bob's court here. The process which Gibson describes is not integration. It's detection of of what's already there. You don't have to integrate stuff that isn't isn't separate. It's only if you assume that your input is little little bits, you know, sensory bits, and then if you assume that, then you have to put those bits back together. You have to construct something, integrate something. But if you think of it as detection, where you're not putting together little bits from of any sort, that's not how you're doing it. Then there's no integrative process uh, involved. By the way, it's not to say that conceptual. Let me just make a distinction. I think Gibson is right. I don't think perception is integration, but conceptualization, conceptualization is integration because one of the things that differentiates conceptual thought from perception is that we reorganize, put things in, in uh, organizational schemes that don't exist out there in the world as such. We, we, we put things in, you know, we put things by our choice into categories and those categories are not out there as Plato might have thought they were, they are they are indeed constructions that we do for a reason, but they are constructions from elements, and that's really that's true integration. Back to we got Bob. A, yeah, we have a question. Bob, do you want to respond? We have a super chat. 
You want me to take care of this? Why don't we Bonnie do that? Bertrand. Yeah, Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Yep. Yeah, Bonnie Bertrand asked, why are you mixing specific sciences with philosophy? And, I, you know, there's an overlapping thing that's always going on. The same with me metaphysics and epistemology. So it's just Lee's expertise tends toward. So, but what? Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. I, 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 that my actual response is, I uh, may not be satisfying, uh, that I don't worry about this, this distinction. I'm just talking about knowledge. And I don't myself particularly care where the knowledge comes from. I'm not too worried about that, about that issue. Mostly what we've just been talking about here is uh, scientific knowledge. Now there is a question and I'm glad Bonnie raised it because I, I've forgotten to get back into this. I wanted to get back into it with Bob and Bonnie has reminded me of this. So that's good uh, that there, there is a question of, okay, let's suppose Gibson is right, which I think he is, but let's suppose that for the moment. Are there any real uh, philosophic, philosophical implications of this point of view? Given that objectivism doesn't, Ayn Rand does insist, and this is a, a good thing, an important good thing, that, that in, in philosophy, you start with the perceptual level. And she says, well, the the idea that sensations are integration, or uh, the perception is integration of sensation is a quote unquote scientific discovery, she says. Now, the only thing I disagree with her on that is that it's not a scientific discovery because it ain't so. And science did not discover that, it's not true. But the idea that that's a scientific issue uh, is true and that uh, philosophy starts with perception, that's true. So that in some sense insulates uh, the philosophical uh, conclusions from the science to some degree, but then I'm not sure it totally does. Here's the area. Here's one area. There are a couple of areas. Here's one area where I think th this per perspective on perception does influence what you're going to say philosophically. I think now uh, this Bob's going to rejoin and will no doubt have a rejoinder here. Uh, one area is the idea that objectivism states, and I, I, I think it's stated as a philosophical point, but maybe it isn't, that perception is an automatic, essentially deterministic process. That when, you know, when, when a, for, for example, when animals perceive, it's just all automatic. Uh, it's because, because after all, it is true. If you have a view of perception, if, the, if it were true that the perception was the automatic integration of sensations by the brain, it would then follow that perception is automatic. But uh, see, I'm denying that. Gibson is denying that. Perception, according to Gibson, is very much a matter of, well, he makes a distinction between obtained and imposed stimulation. And perception is very much a matter of obtained stimulation. You go out and get it. It's an achievement. Self-generated action is really important. One example I've used before, because we, we have talked about some of these things, is a, if you take this, I'll take this pen here. And if you just press the pen against, against or if somebody just presses the pen against your, your hand, you do not get a very a good um, perception or a very uh, meaningful perception of the pen. It doesn't give you a lot of information. But if you take it in your hand and do like this and roll it around actively, and maybe do it here too, after a while, you, it build, you build up a very good percept, percept as it were. I'm not, I shouldn't use that word. Gibson never uses the word percept. You're, you you uh, begin to perceive the, the pen quite uh, meaningfully as a pen. And that's because it's the self-generated action is important. It's an important in visual perception too. I'll give you an example that really isn't Gibsonian. It doesn't really uh, come from Gibson, but I think this, this, I believe this example decisively refutes the view that perception is an automatic uh, and or deterministic process. I think this is, this is a complete refutation. And that is the phenomenon everybody is familiar with. It's called the cocktail party phenomenon. Actually, there are two things that are called the cocktail party phenomenon. Uh, and this is one of them. So I'm just going to refer to this one. And that uh, the phenomenon in question is that you could be at a party with 100 people. And the, there's a cacophony, cacophony, 
cacophony of sound. There, you know, sounds all over the place. You know, people are talking, jabbering here and there. It is possible for you in that uh, milieu of sound to to, uh, to intentionally to direct your attention to one speaker and hear what the one speaker says over all this other stuff. But you have to do it by intention, by mental effort. You have to, it's an effortful possible. You have to choose to do it. If you don't do that, you have a cacophony of sound. And that shows the perception because that's a perception. Perception of, of one person talking is not simply some kind of purely automatic process where your volitional action is irrelevant. It's very relevant. It's, it is essential, actually, absolutely essential in that case to the perception of the, um, you know, the one speaker that you're attending to. It is essential that you do it volitionally. You cannot carve that off. Uh, some people try to say, well, you know, perception's um, automatic because the brain processes are automatic, but perception is not just some brain process. We are not brains in a vat. That's not how it works. The activity of the organism, which in that case is actually internal, the, the uh, perceiving the attentional activity. There are also more external activities of, of picking things up and manipulating them, of walking around things and looking at them. There's all that stuff that Gibson really emphasizes. But even if you take that out, there's a kind of internal attention, which is directly volitional and which is crucial to perception uh, in, uh, in many cases. And this is one that I think is obvious. So I think that uh, the, I don't know whether this is a philosophical view or not, but the view that perception is an automatic process is simply, uh, once you know something about you know, the science of perception, it's completely indefensible. Now, let me turn over to Bob. He's, he's thinking <laughs> about it. Uh, you wanna, you, would you like to comment on this issue, Bob? Uh, yes, I would like to. I don't know what I wanna say though. <clears throat> uh, Automatic is a is a loose term. Uh, if it's certainly it, it focus on what an animal does, it's, it's not the same as what a robot or uh, a machine would do. There's something different about it. Um, it, you know, you're arguing that it's volitional or to use a term we've come up with before, you know, proto-volitional. In that case, the animal case, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, so for example, I don't know if an animal tunes to uh, the prey. It certainly seems that it does that. Uh, and there's all kinds of noise around and all of a sudden, it sees the, the tail of, a, of an antelope over here and it tunes into that. And, uh, and so that sounds like it's controlling its, its conscious apparatus to, to uh, focus its uh, sensory perceptual system to, in that area. Uh, that doesn't sound automatic. On the other hand, maybe yeah, it's questionable. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's wired in such a way that when that level gets above, or when that, uh, when sensations in that area get above some level, it tunes its apparatus in that direction. Uh, is that automatic? Uh, well, it's not volitional in the same sense as conceptual volition. So. Uh, so my answer is I don't know. Uh, can I? Are you, are you ready for me to respond to that, or you want to? Oh, you keep going. Go ahead. Well, <coughs> excuse me. If, from what we were talking about before, uh, the perception is not a snapshot; it's taking place over time, and so, it, and it is not. Uh, it's, it's not a frozen perception in the sense that uh, it, that it won't change as the ambient field changes. So uh, are those changes automatic? Question, I don't know. 
Uh, I tend to think yes, but that's because I'm contrasting it so strongly with volition. Uh, but I also contrast it very strongly with mechanics. So it does seem like there's something in between mechanics and volition. Uh, okay. I, I, the, here's the thing, though, Bob. Uh, I didn't bring up the animals because I will... You know, I have a whole, I and Monroe Trout, we have a whole theory of how, how consciousness works in those cases. But you don't have to go to that level. The level that you can uh, decide this issue, I think, you know, decisively is human introspection. I'm going back to that case that, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you another case. You're listening, you're listening to a, a, a concert by a symphony orchestra. You're sitting there. You can, if you want to, you can direct your attention to the performance of a single performer, you know, one instrument and listen, listen to that one instrument. And it takes effort and it is intentional and it's not in any sense automatic. So I say by human introspection, you can say absolute with absolute certainty that it's not an automatic deterministic process. Whatever turns out to be but, the case for animals. But that, I've got you know, a that's right. Uh, but, yeah, that's right. I'm saying that is crucial to the perceptual process when you attend to a particular instrument or you attend to a particular voice. And there are, I'm sure, many other cases of that sort. Volition is absolutely essential. And I would say it's also essential in the other the cases of self-generated movements. But I'm giving these two cases as very clear. You don't even have to go to the theory of perception to see introspectively that volition is uh, directly involved. And you cannot just carve it out of that, out of the case and say, well, it, it, it's really just sort of an extra thing. You cannot perceive the conversation in, um, uh, in a cocktail party unless you exert volitional, attentional effort to do so. You have to do that. It's an essential part. So I, I think that's decisive. I don't think there's any question about it. And my, that's my opinion. Well, I, I, I don't think that's defensible in total because of, once you direct, once your consciousness says, I want to tune into that, then can't the rest of it be automatic? Yeah, but you see, that's the that's this fallacy, I think it's a fallacy, trying to carve off some some uh, automatic part. Yeah, you could do that, but then but you've destroyed the perception in, in doing that. You have, the actual perception, it is essential to the perceptual process that you use volition. If you want to just say that some part of the process is automatic, that's what you're saying. I can say that about conceptual thinking as well. The neural processes involved in conceptual thought are automatic and deterministic. Yeah, but that doesn't that's... mean that conceptual thinking is automatic and deterministic. That's just wrong. No, so that, I'm, 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 I'm looking at... Sorry? Cycle that epistemology? just covers cycle epistemology. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to give a, a parallel argument. You could say that there's part of the... If you just look at the part of the conceptual process that is neural that's determinate presumably automatic and deterministic but that that is not a complete descri description you can't say from that that conceptualization is is deterministic you can't do that similarly i don't think you can say that perception is deterministic by pointing to some deterministic aspect which would indeed be the the neural processes also would also be there there is a whole lot else involved in perception that is essential to the process yeah. including volitional attention is and other deterministic things. synonymous with mechanistic uh not necessarily not necessarily i mean i'd say in this case it, it probably is we're talking about mechanisms in the brain the neural processes in the brain and i i don't think i don't i don't think that's going to let me ask you why does that why do we need to uh, d delve into that? Let me ask that question. Well, I think of robots as mechanistic and animals could be deterministic without being mechanistic. They, they could be, but again, I'm, I'm suggesting let's, let's forget about the animals for the moment. Well, I don't want to because of evolution. <laughs> because I, I, I'm saying in the human case, what I'm claiming is we know for sure in the human case that perception is not an automatic deterministic process, regardless of what how it turns out. Now, I don't think it's 
deterministic in the animal case either. I don't think so. But I, I'm not, I, I want to take something we know clearly, start with what we know from introspection in humans, and let's start from that. And I can worry about the animals. I'll be perfectly happy to talk about the animals. If we agree that human perception, the perception by humans, is absolutely not an, an automatic deterministic process, if we can agree on that. Yeah, I don't see that we agree on that. Well, I just gave a proof. No. As to why it isn't. No, you, explain you to me how proof. it is. Explain to me how it is that we can uh, perceive a single conversation in a cacophony of sound, absent volitional uh, attention. How does how does that work? Uh, we volitionally decide to tune in that direction, and the rest of it is determined. Again, what you, you what you're saying is the rest of it. The rest of it and the rest of conceptualization is deterministic once the free will aspect has been removed and we're just talking about the brain. So yeah, we're just talking about the brain. The rest of it doesn't impress me, see, because you can, you can make that same uh, move with conceptual thinking. Volition is, is you, actually you, inseparable from the act. You can you say really, the rest of it. You really hold that? that uh... Sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand where, where you're saying, you know, there, there's automatic. Uh, could, could you summarize, uh, Bob, your, your contention here? We got to go to uh, we got to go to Clubhouse pretty soon, right? Not to right. put any pressure on you. <laughs> but go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. We're, we're past time. Yeah, we're going to, but, um, but uh, yeah, briefly, go ahead. I'll let you have the last word and we'll go to Clubhouse. We got a comment from Bob, uh, from Bob, Bonnie again, but but I yes. I want to hear about what Bob. Okay, uh, I'd like to hear on, Bonnie too, please. but let's do I both. Think the you know. sexual system could well be deterministic, even though it can be modified, controlled by volitional aspects okay that's that's your position i have argued against that and we should go what's what i want to i'll but i'll leave with uh bob's the last word there what did body say quickly and then we'll we will adjourn steve it's, well uh, uh daniel said i'll save the comment for bon bonnie and mention in the clubhouse okay uh, but i, I I, it's up to you, Lee. You're exactly. No, I, I was curious, but we we're we're about time. We're probably over time. Okay. So, can you say quickly what she said? Uh, sh sure. But oh, uh, yeah, and then we can talk about it. Uh, Bo Bonnie, come up on the stage, please, if you, if you yeah. will, if you. Okay, she says, but you seem to be trying to contradict objectivism with data measured by various sciences. Perception is automatic for animals, but automatic and volitional for man. Automatic isn't static. Okay, all right, we, we can discuss that. I think uh, I, I kind of agree with some of that, not all of it. We can discuss it in the clubhouse because we're, we're, we, we, ought to, we ought to get over there, I think. So Steve, you wanna okay, close up well, for it? Yeah, thanks uh, everybody for coming to the matrix, but it's not really the matrix and a picture is not an argument. And uh, perception is very complex. And I've learned more from JJ Gibson in, and it's a tragedy that she, she didn't meet Ayn Rand. He. And, uh, JJ was a man, a male. Sorry, sorry, I, I said that wrong. It's a tragedy that they weren't able to meet because there's so much information that he brings about for me. It it teaches you to to see, look more instead of just hear to li listen more. There is more information in uh, JJ G Gibson about perception. Perceptual learning is a is a thing it's uh oh, oh okay now i'm supposed to be let's go to clubhouse and let's discuss this and thanks everybody for coming thank and, you steve 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>